it is in the Old Testament and the last part of the Bible, the first part of the last part of the Bible. Um, and uh, Haggai, if you open it. Haggai is the second smallest book in the Old Testament. Anyone knows what is the smallest book in the Old Testament? The smallest, this is the second smallest. Anyone knows the smallest? Malachi. Malachi? Is it Malachi? Yes. Haggai itself? But this is the second smallest. And the first one is Obadiah. Harry knows it. It's Obadiah. But coming to Haggai, Haggai has two chapters. And it's easy to read. Very, very easy to read. Haggai has just two chapters. And the first chapter has 15 verses, and the second chapter has 23 verses. Altogether, it's a book of 38 verses. It is just 38 verses. How many of you have read Haggai before? It's the smallest book in the Bible, one of the smallest books in the Bible, and easy to read. And I probably read over 50 times the last few months. It came to my attention when I, I don't know whether I read it before or things like that when I was on the flight to London and I didn't know what to preach there as I was traveling and, uh, and I was asking the Lord and browsing through on my mobile phone and then this book came to my attention. And from then on, it's been there on the back of my mind that I've been drawing so many lessons from this and trying to read and understand. And so on, easy to read, very exciting book. And uh, Haggai um, is a, as I said, um, very interesting in, in, in the way that uh, um, Haggai prophesies only for 112 days. He prophesied for 112 days. And he starts August 9th, 29th of 520 BC and ends December 18th of 520 BC. That's all he does. 112 days of ministry. And he prophesies during that time. And uh, Haggai, he prophesies, he opens his mouth four times because that's the four times the Lord gives him the message. And first time he opens his mouth, it is August 29th, 520 BC. And the second time he opens his mouth, October 17th, 520 BC. And the third time he opens his mouth is December 18th, 520 BC in the morning. And the last time he opens his mouth, December 18th, the same day, 520 BC, evening. And this book is extremely important uh, or very significant because this is the book people responded to. Very short ministry, but people responded to this ministry uh, immediately. There was an immediate response. And though it is written 2,539 years ago to date, it is very, very relevant to you and to me in Auckland today very relevant book. Many times we have selective book choice when we go through the Bible. We don't know where to start and how to start. And probably uh, as I was growing up, I started with Psalms and sometimes I jumped into Proverbs. I don't know where to read and where to start and so on. So many times we have selective um, um, books in the Bible, but God speaks through to you and to me probably from the book that you put away as insignificant. Who will read Haggai? Sometimes it happens, I don't know what this guy is saying. Maybe you think insignificant. Maybe you think difficult. Sometimes when you open some book, it might look difficult. And sometimes irrelevant, not relevant. But God is speaking through to you and to me 
through this book. When, when a book looks difficult, that's the book, if you have that mind of challenge, I need to get something, I need to do something. If you have that spirit in you, the lively spirit and the fire in you, that is the thing that many times we, you can't lift it. Immediately, I will lift it. You go for that, don't you? Oh, I can handle it. I can handle it. Oh, why is this guy saying you can't do this? I, I might be able to do that. I'll try it. Why don't we have the same spirit when we think that something is difficult, something is not relevant to us? Why don't we approach? That's the way that the Lord often speaks. And here is the key verse of this, of this um, book. It is time for you. Is it time for you yourselves to be living in your panel houses while this house remains ruin? While this house remains a ruin, it comes from Haggai. This is the question that the Lord asks. And if you open chapter 1, this is what the Lord Almighty says. This is my Bible, the NIV I'm using. It says, the Lord Almighty, and in um, KJV, King James Version, is a lot of hosts. I like that. Lord Almighty is good, but a lot of hosts, and in Telugu it is much more powerful. And he is the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts. And, and that particular title is mentioned here 14 times in this book. And if you look at the book right from the beginning, and if you look at chap, uh, first chapter, verse 3, and uh, the Lord has a complaint in chapter, uh, verse 2. Can, can you look at verse 2? The Lord has a complaint. He is complaining. What is he complaining? This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say that time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai and it says, Is it time for you yourself to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? When the Lord's house remained a ruin, is this the time that you live in your paneled houses? And then say, the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. That is the complaint. That is what the Lord says. And followed by the complaint, you have a curse. People have a curse. What is the curse? Give careful thought. I'm reading verse 5, if you follow. Give careful thought to your ways. Give careful thought to your ways. A pertinent words here in this, in, this, in this book. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but have harvested little. You eat so much, but you never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you are not warm. You earn wages, only put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Set your priorities right, in other words. And here is the instruction. Go up to the mountains and bring down timber and build a house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored. This is the place that I want to be honored. I want my name to be glorified. This is the place. Go and get the wood, get the materials, build the house, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why? Declares the Lord Almighty. Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth it crops. I call for a drought on the fields, and the mountains and on the grain, the new wine, the oil, and whatever the ground produces on men and cattle and on the labor of your hands. 
That's the curse. You got so much, but you enjoy very little. You eat so much, but you are satisfied very little. And you got so much, but nothing is happening. That, that is the curse. And people immediately respond and they start to construct the temple. That's what we see. Before they construct, they, they, they confess, they understand, they immediately say, Lord, we have done not right. And our motives are very, very selfish. We have taken our own selves, our own names, our own houses, and our own things as the priority and left your house unattended and, and they confess. And if you go on to read the same chapter, they start to construct. So I have given you five words in the first chapter itself. The first word is, Lord complains. And the second one is a curse. And the third one is people confess, say, Lord, we are sorry. And fourth one is they begin to construct. That is chapter one. And because they confess and because they return to the Lord, says, I have forgiven you. And here you go. And he starts to give comfort if you start reading from chapter two. Immediately there's a shift of mood and everything, and he starts to give comfort. Don't be afraid is found in three times in this last chapter. Don't be, don't be worried, don't be afraid. Be confident. I will be with you. He starts to give comfort. And then if you read a little further down in chapter 2, which is 23 verses, and he gives a beautiful comparison here. Beautiful comparison here. For example, you are you are making some egg, egg something with egg and some. You break eggs and then the three of the eggs that you grow, they are fine, good eggs, and one of them is rotten. What happens to the curry that you're making or whatever you're making? The three make the one good, or the one that is bad makes the three bad. What happens? You got flu, and fifty-nine people are no flu. And you enter. You become well or the other becomes sick. Others. That's that's what it is. That's what the comparison the Lord the Lord gives in this book. You will not become good. Actually, you make bad, you make others bad. That is the physical or the goodness has to come from inside. It is internal. By going to the holy places, by doing good things. By pretending to be good, you won't be good. You only make things bad. One leper will can turn a whole village, a, a village of lepers. So the the holiness has to come from inside. It, the, 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 the inside of it has to be changed, not just by externally uh, trying to be good and so on while you are still bad that's the comparison that the lord brings in in this and then he makes a covenant with this man called Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel is the son of jehoiakim the last king of israel and jehoiakim is the grandson of david i repeat important this guy Zerubbabel. He's the great, 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 great grand grandson of David. You know what? What the Lord's covenant with David was: your children, your lineage will be on the throne of Israel. And for some time, for seventy years at least, or more than that, there was no king. After Jehoiakim did great um, sin in the sight of the Lord. Now he restores his covenant with Zerubbabel and he gives a ring, a signet ring. He gives a signet, same as um, uh, the, the, the uh, par, uh, prodigal son, the parable of the prodigal son. He is restored and a signet ring. You know signet ring? You know signet ring? I don't know whether you know it. And signet ring in those days as, as that seal and, and, and you put, put it in the... Um, and then, Put it as a, as, a, as a stamp. So if the signature is done, you, you've got the whole thing. 
You know what happened to the prodigal son? You know what did prodigal son do? What did he do? What did he do? Prodigal son, I'm asking a question. Huh? Wasted. Wasted. He sold off family property, family inheritance. And wasted. He came empty handed. Nothing. Probably half the half the half the uh, family inheritance he wasted completely. Will you give him a checkbook again? Family checkbook? Will you? That's father did. He gave the signature ring. He put the signature ring. Now he can sell the other half. He has given the power, inheritance. That's why the Bible is incredible, incredible. That's why it doesn't make sense for people. It's incredible. It's incredible. For the man who wasted the whole of their family property and he gives the authority again to do the same if he wants to. The same he does it here to us, to me and to you as well. And he calls for action from you and from me. While my house remains a ruin, where are you living? You are living in paneled houses and you are enjoying yourself. That is, that is the Lord's prophecy. And background to this prophecy, if you want to know, read the first five chapters of um, 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 Ezra. The whole story will come from the first five chapters of Ezra. If you remember, 2626 years ago, BC 6 or 7, Nebuchadnezzar goes and takes this Jerusalem and sees, he seized it. And he took 10,000 young people from that uh, city, Judah, at that time. You know some prominent names? Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, Meshach, and you know their, their actual names? What is Daniel's name is Daniel anyway. And what is Shadrach's name? Okay, you do it. You do your research. Uh, but anyway, these are prominent names. But we only named four names. But actually Nebuchadnezzar took about 10,000 young people. But only four people stood for the Lord. And that's why uh, they made history. Uh, in that in that uh, in that reign, and uh, why did that happen? Why did that happen? Uh, the Lord allowed His own city to be captured by a foreign king. And interestingly, if you read the first verse, the first few verses of Daniel, uh, it says, "My servant Nebuchadnezzar, I allowed him to do this." And that is good enough to understand. Who God is. He is the boss. He is the in charge. He, he has every right of your life and mine. Which we were discussing last yesterday uh, for, our, for our meeting. He allows Nebuchadnezzar to do this and then he takes these 10,000 boys and, and so on. And uh, um, there is a reason for it. And if you go back and then read uh, the, the, the books of uh, Jeremiah and the book of Isaiah. And the book of Exodus, God's instructions were very, very clear. Every seventh year, you don't plant anything. Leave it fallow. Leave the land fallow. You don't irrigate at that time. You have it for six years. Seventh year, you don't plant anything. Enjoy for what you've got for the six years. That's the Lord's instruction. Seventh year, whatever grows in that land, it must be for the poor people. It must be for the passers-by. They must come and then grab whatever they want from these lands. But these people, they never listened. They, what they did was they planted, they had not three crops, four crops a year. And if possible, in between the fifth crop. The same thing happens in Andhra Pradesh if you go to Bhakti. Crops, they want to grab as much as possible from the uh, Lord heads after, after it is 70 year, becomes 70 years, the Lord said, enough is enough, you get out of this land, I have to leave this land for 70 years, which you did not obey, you go back and then read, that's the story. 
keeps the land vacant. And anyway, here is the ruins of the of 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 of, of uh, the temple, and these people come back. And if you read Ezra, the chapter one, and uh, um, it tells chapter one tells what happened when 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 Nebuchadnezzar came and all this all all the destruction happened and uh, how he destroyed and how cruel he was and so on. And if you read the second chapter, you have the list of about 50,000 50, people uh, returning to this um, uh, section by section or um, 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 what is it called? The tribe, tribe after tribe. You have the list of how many people returned and so on. And in chapter three, you you they, they all people come and then put the foundation for the um, um, in in seven months they build the altar. Come back to Jerusalem, they build the altar and they start to sacrifice. Uh, but they're only foundations. And if you move to the fifth chapter, all the elderly were weeping, thinking about the glory of the temple that was at that time. And while young people were laughing. Uh, thinking that they are going to build a temple and so on, you will see that mixture, mixed emotions of some people crying and some people laughing, and then there is a jubilation of past and present and so on. It's a beautifully emotionally uh, written chapter if you read Ezra 5. And from there, 15 years, they did not touch the temple again. And they went and they built their own houses and so on. And uh, King Cyrus used to send money to build the temple, but they used that money for their own selves. The government gave them the salaries, but they did not do the work. Does it ring any bell to you? Any salary that you and I get is actually a gift from the Lord. Your primary responsibility, my primary responsibility is build the Lord's temple first. If we're using it up for our own selves, this is what the Lord tells us. While you're living in family houses and leaving my house desolate, leaving my house ruined, what do we do? What is what is the Lord's? Go up, get, get the things for the construction. And as I approach the books, many, many things are very uh, important to me. If you read the chapter one, first, first verse, in the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of she Shealtatl, and governor of Judah, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. It's not a once upon a time story. It's not a long time ago, there was a prince and there was a princess and this guy went and married that prince. That, 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 it's not the kind of story that you find. You know, it's not fables, it's not fairy tales. It is with exact reference to a pagan king. You look up the history, you will see Darius, you will see Cyrus and all these different people. And at the time, and especially this particular book, it comes with the dates as I've given you the dates which prophecy came in which day and so on. Bible's historical accuracy, no one could deny. That's why they keep it in the shop. They cannot disprove it. They cannot argue against this book. That's why they make sure that they don't touch it. And this is a challenge for you and for me. Where, where is your Bible? Is it in the shop? Is somewhere very nicely kept or is it read? Is again a challenge for you. Bible is historically challenged, historically proven, archaeologically proven book, and no one can deny it. And that's point number one that I get from the first verse. The second point that I get from the very verse, first verse is this: the word of the Lord came to two people in this land. Can you tell me the first name? Is there? Zerubbabel. Who is Zerubbabel? Don't worry about his dad. What what is he? Governor is the administrator of that place, the collector, governor. He is the guy, the IRB, IRB kind of fellow. And uh, who is the second one? Joshua. Who is Joshua? IWC, someone in the IWC, someone in the priest, someone in, 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 in that, that 
particular group, somewhere there down the line, I don't know where that was. It came to the one on the top, it came one on the lowest rung of the ladder in financial matters. And the word of the Lord is relevant to you and to me and to everyone. Many times we think it is someone else's job. It is that guy's job that he does. And he, he has to do it. It's not my job. It, 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 it doesn't work like that. Every one of us has to be a witness to the Lord. Every, it's, it's the job of every one of us to look for the opportunity to present the word of God. And present every conversation of yours. What is your conversations like when you gather together? Sometimes after Bible study and so on, we all gather together. And sometimes after church, we gather together here. And sometimes at the outside, we gather together. We, when, when we meet, what are our conversations like? When you meet a new person, the new acquaintance comes in, what is your conversations like? Are people able to see God in our conversations? Are people able to see God in the actions or reactions of us? Are we finding opportunities to strike a conversation? I was watching rugby the other day. In rugby, what happens is some people play. How many people will be on the field playing actually? 15, 29? 30 in total. 30 in total, including extra players? The field, on the field. On the field. 15 people on the, on the, on, on the field. But there will be at least 15 extra. Waiting outside. They're doing like this. If you, have, if you have seen, they're, they're keeping themselves safe. What are they waiting for? If someone falls, if some, something happens there, this guy will go in. Same thing happens in football, same thing happens in volleyball. They're all extra players all the time. But there's only one team that there's no extra player. Everyone has to play. Everyone plays. That is the team of the Lord of the Hosts. You and I have no extra player capacity here. Everyone has to be in the field. This is point number one. Point number two. Steve Hansen or whoever is on the top, he will be looking at and he has uh, some mic here and this, he has some option of talking to someone there. What, what is he actually doing? Interaction. Interaction, what does he do actually? He moves them, right? <coughs> okay, let this guy out and let this guy go in and that guy might, might cover that area or something is happening. He will be completely thinking about the strategy of the game and what is happening and the movement and so on. He would be constantly conversing about this. Would he worry about what David is doing in front of the camera in, 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 in Nash Road? Would he be worried at all? God will be able to use you and play around you and use you to move this way and that way and, and so on only when you are in the field and playing for him, not extra players. There's no extra player status in God's kingdom. You've got to be in the field and the Lord tells you move, go to Queen Street or talk to that guy next to you in the bus. Or maybe you need to invite him for a cup of tea at home. <clears throat> God will be directing you, using you constantly and talking to you and telling you what has to do. The, Lord of, the, the word of the Lord came to Zerubbabel somewhere in, in, in an administrative office overlooking the glass window and looking at good news. Come on man, get out and do this, this, this. My house is in ruins. You got to go on there, get, cut the wood and get, and then build the house. Are you waiting for the call of the Lord? Are you on the bench? Are you actually in the field? And it is everyone's job, full-time job. I want you to talk about this, this is the extra place. What's happening on your table? Michael's, Michael's home, we were talking about these things. As we read, Acts, the New Testament, time and again, this comes, they met in their homes, they met in their homes, 
Acts 2, 46. Can someone read? Acts chapter 2, 46. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. They met together in the temple courts, but they ate together in their homes, happy to share their food and with joyful hearts. I don't see these faces in church. I don't see this kind of smile in church. And I, saw, I don't see this kind of interaction in church. It is one man doing it and all others will be doing it. This kind of, this kind of, thing. all you see is someone's back as you seated, but as you sit around the table, you see faces. It's not one-sided interaction, it's everyone's interaction, everyone has a voice. Everyone has a choice. And at this time, a phone call comes, we'll take it later on, let me enjoy this time first. How many times you left your meal and then went outside and then talked to someone in the phone? If the same phone call comes in the church, very important. Go outside on the, on the, on the staircase and immediately attend to this Tom, Dick and Harry. This doesn't happen there. What's happening in your homes, your panel homes, your double storied homes, your well-heated homes? What is happening around your table? What kind of story is being told? And I'm challenging you as you read the word of God and then understand and then put it in stories and then examples and then start to talk at your tables. You will have your meal one and a half hours, I'm telling you. And if you start to read Romans at your table, immediately they go and then wash their hands quickly and put their plate on away. But you read and you put it in the context, understand the mood of it and everything else, and then put it in my stories and your own examples and so on. And to start telling the stories. Why is it so interesting to talk to Brother Hanukkah all the time? He tells his stories. He gives examples. He brings in, I don't know where the story comes from. He tells his stories. That's what Jesus did. He told him parables. You and I need to read the word of God and summarize it and put it in examples and give the examples and tell the stories. People will listen. Ah, really? That story is in the Bible, where is it? They immediately go. Build. Go. Cut the wood. Get it. Build a house. Your homes. Can someone read Acts 5.42? Acts chapter 5, 42. Day after day, in the temple court, from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. Every Sunday? Is it every Sunday? I'm asking questions. Same, same thing. Is it every Sunday? Every day in the temple and in the people's homes. And what did they do? They continued teaching the people and telling the good news. There's only one story that they told that Jesus Christ, Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is the Lord. That's the story. And Paul writing to Philemon, he says, To Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer, and to the church in your house. The church is the church was in his house. And Paul writing to Rome, Roman uh, church in Rome, he says, Greek, Greek Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla and Aquila. And the church that is in their house. Romans 16, verse 3. And Paul writing to Colossians, he says, Greet the brethren 
called Laodicea and Nymphus and the church that is in the house that is church in the house Paul writing to Timothy says give hospitality to the elders and so on you know Abraham he served the angels by serving it's not the angels in fact he served the Lord You know, Mary and Martha, they opened the house for the Lord. You know the result? He opened the tomb of Lazarus. And if doors need to open in my house, your doors need to open for the Lord. You know what Zacchaeus did? He had Jesus home. You know the result? Jesus gives a gift card. Go to Westfield and buy this. It is a gift card. Did he give one? He gave one in fact. It is salvation. Go to heaven and enjoy the mansions. Salvation is come to this house today. Because he had Jesus in his house. Your house and my house need to be open for the Lord. Conversations need to happen. Friendships need to be need to take place in that place and those people need to be led to the Lord. Every opportunity, your college, your office, your bus, and I don't know where you're meeting people, maybe in the court outside, if you are a, um, oh, you guys play shuttlecock and cricket and whatnot, and make friendships there, bring people in, tell them about the love of God. That's the place that, that you and I need to be. What is your situation like? Is it usable or not usable? There are many tools like this in my house. Very, very difficult to use. Very difficult to use. And health and safety tells us if you use a wrong tool, actually you hurt yourself. If the tool is not ready, prepared and sharpened enough, they actually damage the thing that you're going to do. And probably the, the, the chances that uh, you will, you will, are you rusted, useless? left there, waiting, benched. What is the story? You live in family houses while my house is in ruins. What are you going to do about this house? And Peter tells us, prepare your minds for action, man. Being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not one tool that we are talking about. We have got rid of the wristwatch, and this does only one job. And we replaced it with one that can do several jobs. You know, multitasking nowadays, people are saying. Are you there only for one thing? You can only do one thing in your life? Are you a multi, multitasker? Can you do multitask? Tell, go into the world and then tell that I can only do one thing. No one will give you the job. The first thing that you find, I find in your CV is I'm a multitasker. I can do one, two, three, four, five things. And then you sell yourself. And what are you doing for the Lord? Just one thing? Just single thing? Single thing for one, one minute or ten minutes or one hour a week? Are we giving ourselves out to the Lord 24-7? Are we using our bedrooms, are we using our houses, or our, 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 our dining tables, our cars, giving lift to people, have conversations, and there are so many things. So you're just jumping from one place to another place and then just enjoying yourself. When I first came, I used to go to three churches. That's where I found uh, Ramesh in one of those churches and we made friendship with or are we going out and doing something for the Lord? Are we going into the world and then building, cutting the raw wood and bringing people inside and then shaping them and then using them in the house of the Lord to build the house of the Lord? Or are you going there and enjoying yourself one more entertainment session, whether it is whatever it is? What are you doing? What is what you what what has your time gone for yesterday? How many conversations you, 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 you struck with people? 
What have you done to build the houses? Someone called me the other day and then said, I listened to one of your messages, speeches, speeches, he said. And then you told you, you said, uh, people are jumping from church to church. What is wrong with it? My phone was not good and I moved to a second phone. And this was not good and I changed my table. Why, why don't I go for some other church and do something else? And I felt like asking, I was being, just being, it was not in the right mood and things like that. I didn't get into serious conversation. I, I wanted to ask, would you change the spouse again? Would you change your spouse just because she or he are old? There are certain non-negotiables in your life. There are certain non-negotiables in your life. You go by promises, don't you? What have you done yesterday? How much time has you given over your life? Your time, your resources, your money, your houses and whatnot, and everything else. This is the pertinent question that is coming from Haggai. I'm telling you again, it's 38, 38 verses, and you can read again and again and again and again. There's so many things that I just looked at only one verse today. And here is the pertinent question. While you live comfortably using my own resources, everything that I have given you, and living in paneled houses, why is my house in ruin? What have you done for the house? Many times we think church has to give you some service. Church has to give you some good experience. No, my friends, no, no. This is your time to serve the Lord. Churches are for knowing the Lord. Churches are for serving the Lord. Not you getting some service or you getting some help, you getting something out of that. You and I have to stand and then serve the Lord and build his home. That's the call of Haggai, the smallest book, one of the smallest books in the Bible. And the last point that I would like to mention here is he gives a signal train to Zerubbabel, the governor of that place. He restores his relationship, his covenant with that man just because he understood and he confessed. He confessed. He confessed, Lord, what I have done is not right. And you, I encourage you to look through your life and then tell what have I done for the Lord? How many resources I have received and how much I have given up for the Lord? For the love, you have heard what he has done on that mountain. On this mountain, the Lord will provide. And he did. And he did for you and for me. On that mountain, he provided. Not only providing you and taking you into home and giving you all the authority, giving a signatory ring. You read the last few verses of Haggai. That's what he does. He gives you the authority to do everything and he calls you adopted children, my own children. For every child of his, like you and me, God gave his own child, his own begotten son. And he rewrites or re-signs that contract with you and for me. And what would you do? What would you do? If your dad has this much of land, and what would you do? What is your responsibility? If he has 10 acres of land, what is your responsibility? You add one more? Yes or no? As the generation passes from one to the other, what, have, what has to happen? This, you, you, you sell things away or whether you add it, add to it. What would you do? You sell it away and dispose of? Depends on the situation. What situation that, that, that depends? If we want to sell the Lord, we don't have the money, we can sell it. We can't add. We can't add the land. If we have it in a cut line, if we don't have the money, we are serving the Lord. So, of course, we need money. We will sell one, we will sell one acre of land. It will go on. We can't add one more acre. But Very we good. can add one thing. That's what I want to hear, actually. We can add one, but we can add one more thing. We can add the people for the Lord. 
we can do that thing, but we can't add the lines. You are the only one who got the message. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord's house is in the ruins, and you and I got to build. While that's the Lord's complaint, actually, whether you are living in the paddled houses and my house is in ruin, whether you add, that you build, whether you improve it, what is the cost? And is the Lord debtor and then take your acres and then add to his own? No, he's not a debtor. He gives you, he has given you, he's given you so much. He has given you so much. He has given you jobs, he's given you houses, you've given me, he's given everything out, out unto you. And he is not a debtor. The Lord is the Father, and all that He has given to us, we keep on adding, building, building the house, using our resources, using our work. We are the workers. We add to the family property. We add to the kingdom purposes. That's what I should say. And he signs the signature. And he gives his own son unto the Lord, uh, unto us. And as we approach this bread and this drink, this is what you need to examine. The reason for that covenant to be reestablished, confession. And you and I examine our own selves. What is our life like? What are we bringing back into the house? Whether we are building, rebuilding. 